Well, thank you for joining us. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and we'll address, we have some pre-questions that have kind of come up during our, um, during our visits and discussions with families, but please, you know, feel free to add any additional questions in the chat at any time. Um, I thought maybe before we get started, we can just introduce ourselves um, from the team, because I know not everybody works with the same people. So I'll go first. Um, my name is Kate uh, Kreider. I'm one of the social workers. I primarily work with Margie. Um, whoever would like to go next. I'm Margie. I'm one of the nurses with the PD team. I'm Amy. I'm one of the music therapists. I'm Bridget. I'm the child life specialist. Is that it? Hi, I'm Amy Ferber. I'm the uh, one of the social workers. Hi, I'm Mustafa Chalan. I'm uh, the pediatric palliative care doctor. So, um, we decided to put this event together. Um, because there's a lot of information out there around the COVID vaccines that are available. And within that information, there's um, some misinformation, some, um, some myths that aren't necessarily um, fact-based, and it causes a lot of confusion. So our kind of our goal today is not to convince anyone to take the vaccine. Um, we really just want to answer some questions that some families have um, brought up. And, and this is being recorded. We're going to put it on our PDPAL YouTube page so you can refer to it at any time. You can send it, you know, let family and friends know that it's there. Because this information, although um, it's geared towards our PDPAL families. It's really across the board. This is for anybody um, who's interested in learning more about, um, about the vaccine. So I wanted to just start by um, naming our panelists here. So Dr. Mustafa Jailin has offered to be one of our um, speakers as well as Margie Luna, um, one of our nurses to answer our questions. And this really is just a conversation. Nobody here is a COVID expert. We're really just, um, we're following with, you know, what we find on the CDC and, um, you know, different information that Bay State puts out. So um, this really is just a conversation. So the first uh, question um, for both of you is, you know, the, the COVID vaccines, it felt like they were, um, created really quickly. And so some people are fearful that this is too fast. This is happening too fast. And I was wondering if, you know, either one of you could kind of speak, speak to that. So this is one question I have uh, heard a lot about. Um, I, I have done similar panels, uh, small uh, size panels, um, and some big of size of them as well um, to the community as well. Um, I'm a part of the Turkish community and there were a lot of questions in that community too. So we have arranged similar things. And this is one of the most common questions like, oh, it takes years for medications to be even approved, let alone being developed. So the unique thing about this, uh, these vaccines is there was a huge support, huge financial uh, support uh, behind this. Um, the the countries were, were paying for it because it was a, it was the biggest crisis, uh, one of the biggest crises uh, for the last several decades, probably. So there was um, quite a lot of support behind it. And besides that, the, the, this type of vaccine um, is not new. So it has been, um, I know it's, it's, um, it's the first time that it, it's being used uh, in um, around the globe and uh, in uh, huge amounts of on huge amounts of people but the, this type of vaccine has been tried before has been used for uh, different uh, but much less common diseases 
So it was fairly easy and quick to just modify it for COVID and uh, start using for it. It also has bypassed uh, quite a lot of, um, so normally when you develop a vaccine or a medication, uh, it first goes through um, laboratory research being searched on the animals, and then it goes to healthy people, and then it goes to people who are at risk. Um, in this case, all these steps were taken at the same time due to the uh, urgency of the condition. So uh, this has also uh, saved quite a lot of time for the for the vaccines to develop to be developed, um, and that's that's I think one of the biggest reasons why it was developed so quick. Um, but there is a pretty strong evidence behind it. This, the studies were done uh, on quite a lot of people, and it has been used for um, for for so many people now. Like it used to be just forty thousand uh, people. Now it's um, millions of people uh, around the globe, not only in the United States. So, and there haven't been uh, any huge side effects that has been seen now um for for the biggest majority of the people so that that gives a sense of uh safety um based on what we know so far thank you mustafa um that kind of leads into the next myth or question that folks have just concern that there were um there was information out there that the shot was actually the vaccine contained COVID. Can you speak to, in kind of layman's term, just how the vaccine works and um, what it consists of? Margie, would you like to take that or? No, go ahead. Okay. So um, in this vaccine, um, what the specific vaccine does is it's a it's a, a little different vaccine. Most of the vaccines that we know of uh, has the uh, weakened virus uh, to be given to the patients, uh, so our um, our immune systems get used to that that pathogen, and then when it sees the real virus, um, it it reacts to it much faster and it doesn't get as sick because uh, it has a it has a knowledge of the enemy. Um, in this vaccine, it's an mRNA vaccine. What that what it means is it's um, it's attached to a piece of mRNA. Uh, it's called messenger RNA. So it doesn't really um, do it doesn't go into our DNA or alter that or do anything like that. But it's just a messenger. Uh, it goes into the cells of our bodies and um, it tells it um, produces the protein that the virus has, uh, that the virus uses to attach to the cells. So it, um, when it gives that message to the cells, those cells uh, produces that protein. And then because it's an unusual protein for our body, our body learns uh, and has knowledge about that protein now. So whenever the body um, interacts with the same protein, um, aka the virus itself, um, then it has a knowledge that this is um, not a protein, it should be in my in my body. And I already know that protein and I already have the guns, already have the ammunition to uh, resist that, that virus, that protein. So I'm not ex accepting this, this protein in my, in my body. Um, even if the protein makes, I mean, the virus makes its way into the body, um, being vaccinated decreases the chances of being severely ill um, because, again, our body has um, some preparedness towards the disease itself. So again, um, what the, um, the virus is not in the, um, in the vaccine at all. Uh, it just um, presents the protein uh, that the virus uses to get into our body. So our body will have some knowledge of that uh, specific protein. Okay. Um, and 
There are some worries that this vaccine might impact, um, be unsafe for women who are pregnant or might have lasting impacts on fertility. Um, And I know that this is, uh, you know, we've only started vaccinating folks um, in like December, really, um, for it to be available, you know, to um, regular folks. Um, So there's a lot we don't know, but I was wondering, you know, what's the general consensus thus far of just um, the impact on pregnancy or fertility? Yeah, you're helping to, you know, add on also a Mustafa, but there is no evidence um, out there that any COVID vaccine will affect fertility. Um, Those that are trying to become pregnant um, do not need to avoid pregnancy if they receive the vaccine and they are encouraged to receive it. Though the CDC does state to contact your physician first to make sure that you're safe to receive it. Thank you, Margie. Anything else? Um, Kate, your point was great. I mean, it's a new vaccine uh, and it wasn't trialed on the pregnant people when it was being developed, but there were people who became pregnant or who found out they were pregnant. And so far, as Margie just said, there is no evidence that it has affected their babies, uh, nor uh, it decreases the people's um, uh, productivity. Um, So the, the Problem is again, it's a new vaccine, so nobody can 100% say anything, but there is no reason to believe that it would cause any, like, there is nothing in the vaccine that would go ahead and um, attack the cells or the um, or the body parts that would uh, that would um, help um, having more babies. So, there is no evidence, there is no reason to think that it would be. Uh, contraindicated or it would be harmful to a pregnant woman or or a baby. Um, But what we know is what there's uh, evidence about is the pregnant woman gets much, uh, much sicker compared to the uh, same age group woman. So uh, if if um, a pay if a pregnant woman get uh, gets COVID, uh, their chance of being admitted to the ICU uh, doubles. Uh, compares to the same age group, uh, as well as uh, their risk of uh, dying of COVID. So um, right now, uh, all, both the um, obstetrics committees and the pediatric committees uh, recommend um, pregnant women uh, getting the vaccine. But of course, um, first uh, after uh, speaking with their doctors. Yeah, so really just um, for framing it in like a risk assessment, um, it's helpful to kind of understand and, and hopefully for people who are in that position making their decision for themselves. Um, there are quite a few vaccines now. Um, in the beginning, it was like Pfizer or Moderna. And now there's Johnson & Johnson, which is just one shot. Um, AstraZeneca is, you know, not available right now in the United States, but something that's in the news a lot. So some folks are are wondering, is there a difference between the vaccines or um, do I have a choice in which one I have an opportunity to get if I schedule an appointment? Um, Margie, please um, help me if you want to add anything. Uh, but uh, there are three vaccines uh, that is available, as you have said. Um, Moderna and Pfizer are pretty similar, and they seem to be uh, working um, equally equally well. Uh, Johnson and Johnson is one vaccine. Its protectivity, based on the recent based on the studies so far, doesn't seem to as be as high as the other two. Um, but it's still pretty high for any vaccine. It's it's uh, over 85%, uh, which again is, um, it's, it's amazing for a vaccine. Um, so I think at this point, um, I haven't done that because we got it through the hospital, but my, when my friends said that they tried to 
scheduled appointments um, or when they went for their appointments, they were given the choice to select which va vaccine they wanted. I don't know if that will be the case all the time because every week is different. Um, we don't have a, have a huge supply to uh, have that luxury all the time. But as far as I know, currently um, that has been asked to the um, to the uh, people who wants to be vaccinated. Um, but besides that, any vaccine is uh, better than no vaccine. 85% is um, much better than 0%. So uh, I think like whatever vaccine we can get our hands onto, uh, we should get them. AstraZeneca, like there are uh, still ongoing um, studies. There are some side effects that were found. But again, uh, it doesn't really um, is available in the United States for now. So I don't think we need to um, we need to worry about it. And if if it will be available, I'm sure there will be more research, and um, it needs to go through FDA approval as well. So I'm sure it will be um, considered safe uh, if it if it's approved by the FDA. And I, I also just want to add that um, for those of you who are connected to our PDPAL program, signing up for a vaccine can feel daunting and confusing. And so if you have any questions about that process, please ask one of um, your team members and we can try to um, give some pointers or suggestions and assist with that. Um, and a reminder that all of our caregivers who are caring for any of our PD kids, um, you are eligible for um, a vaccine if you're interested in one. Um, I believe in Massachusetts, April 19th, it's open to the general public. But as of right now, um, our parents and caregivers uh, have that opportunity if they, if they would like it. Um, there are some side effects that we know um, people, I, I, for myself, I had the Pfizer vaccine and I was pretty lethargic the next day and my arm really hurt. Um, and uh, thankfully I work closely with a nurse, uh, Margie, who um, was helpful in just, you know, what you can do to ahead of time if you're going, you know, going in for your shot. So I was wondering, you know, what, what might be helpful for people to do um, to prepare for their shot in the event that they might have some mild side effects that are time limited? Yeah, I would just simply say to expect to rest and have a day off the following day or two. Um, don't expect to be lifting heavy equipment or, you know, doing anything uh, you know, strenuous. Um, you might have a few symptoms for 24 hours or 48 hours, um, but most people, it, uh, your symptoms have resolved within 48 hours. And if they last further than that, I would contact your physician. Thanks. Unfortunately, I know that um, our community here in Western Mass was definitely impacted in our, and some of our PD families were impacted by COVID. Um, some folks are asking if I've had COVID, if I unfortunately went through that, am I immune? Do I still need to get a vaccine? Um, you know, most people that get sick with a virus do have a natural immunity, but um... The CDC does state that the natural immunity um, from a COVID vaccine, from, from receiving, from um, being sick with the COVID-19 um, doesn't last very long. So the CDC is recommending that you still receive the vaccine even if you've had COVID-19. And do you all, do either of you know if you had COVID recently, how long you have to wait to get a vaccine? I don't have it on top of my head. It used to be 90 days, uh, but I'm not sure if they have uh, readjusted the uh, time since the uh, vaccine is more available. But um, while we are going through uh, the questions, I can quickly look up and uh, try to find the most recent answer for that for the question. Okay. Thank you. I heard also 90 days. 
um, for folks who are getting the two shots, so right now Pfizer or Moderna, um, are you still at risk? I know you have to wait somewhere between, I think it's 28 days, something around that time frame to get your second shot. Are you still at risk of getting COVID even if you've received one shot? Yes, the productivity or protectivity of the of one shot is not as uh, strong as two shots. Um, what we consider fully immunized, uh, which is 95% pr protected, uh, is um, two weeks after getting the second shot. Even after that, there's still a 5% risk. So um, we should still be uh, considering uh, good hand hygiene, uh, putting on our mask when we are going into crowded areas, especially uh, closed cr crowded areas like um, like stores, um, gym, or uh, any other places like that, because gyms are being open uh, as well uh, currently. Um, and again, practice very, very good hand, hand hygiene. Um, but CDC has uh, have been saying that now, after you are um, immunized and two weeks after you get uh, your second shot, uh, um, you would be able to um, hang out with people in closed spaces without wearing a mask or uh, being worried about uh, social, social distancing. But again, this is with the people who are vaccinated as well. So um, I think being on the, um, cautious side, especially when we are uh, going into crowded areas, is still very important. But I think we can start um, enjoying and feeling some sense of uh, normalcy as well. Um, personally, it's refresh refreshing to hear that <laughs> after over a year of uh, hibernating is what it feels like. Um, <laughs> There are, a, there's, and while I was looking on, on the web, um, just around, you know, kind of thoughts on COVID and, and information that's out there, um, there's quite a bit of like alternative remedies. So, um, and this has come up too in some of my visits, of folks asking, well, if I take the right supplements. If I, if I do the hand washing and, and make sure that, you know, I'm protecting myself as best I can against germs. If I do more of, um, more like natural ways of, um, treating COVID, um, is that enough? Is that, is that, um, effective? And I realize that this is COVID impacts folks very differently. And there's a wide spectrum of how people experience COVID if they do become sick with the, the virus. Um, but generally, um, what, what are your thoughts on just the more like going more all natural with um, trying to keep yourself safe from COVID? Um, so there are, uh, there's not evidence that any nutrients or vitamins can um, prevent you from getting COVID-19, um, but some nutrients can help your immune system stay strong. So if you're deficient in potassium or a vitamin D or maybe increasing vitamin C or zinc can help your body stay strong and help your immune system, but it's not going to help you prevent you from becoming, evidence says it's not going to prevent you from coming sick with COVID-19 and the CDC does recommend receiving the vaccine when you're eligible. Just one note, as I promised, I was looking up the 90 days. Okay. Uh, so it is, um, first of all, it is recommended for you to fully recover before you get the vaccine if you are sick with COVID. Um, but besides that, because the, um, uh, vaccine is not uh, readily available for everyone. Um, they say um, it's okay to wait for 19, 90 days, but they you don't have to um, wait for 90 days um, 
if you have access to the vaccine. Thank you for looking that up, Mustafa. <laughs> um, in real time, Googling. Um, some folks have also spoken about, um, you know, they get, they've gotten the flu shot in the past and they've felt really terrible and they are really worried about because COVID feels much, and, and it is bigger than the flu, but it also feels so much bigger than any other illness that we kind of run into. So there's a lot of fear that, um, if they get the vaccine, they'll be that much sicker from it. Um, so any suggestions um, or input for folks who have, who maybe have a, a sensitivity or are more reactive to, to shots? So there are different reasons uh, for uh, the flu shot to, um, for people to have sensitivity to, to the flu shot sometimes. It's uh, because of the ingredients um, of it, that if they have a specific sensitivity to an ingredient in it, um, which is not very common, but it does happen sometimes. Um, and keep in mind the way flu shot, flu vaccine works is different uh, than the, uh, the way COVID vaccine works. So there are two separate mechanisms um, and they act differently for uh, two different uh, for different vaccines. So there is no uh, reason to believe that um, a person will be uh, very sick or has higher side effects if they uh, feel very sick or tired after the flu shot. Having said that, if you have um, quite a few um, allergies, uh, if you have experienced um, big issues with most of the shots, it's always a good idea to speak with your doctor um, and decide decide with them um, about how to move forward with that. Uh, but keep in mind, this is really a very small uh, percentage of the of the community that really has um, a lot of allergies to vaccines or a lot of reactions to the vaccines. I'm not talking about uh, feeling a little tired for a day or two or having uh, arm soreness, these are normal side effects with pretty much all the vaccines, uh, but I'm talking about being really sick, um, requiring medical attention uh, for those side effects, then uh, it's a good idea to speak with your doctor before you move forward. Thank you. And we're hearing about different strands of COVID. Um, are the vaccines, do they cover the, the newer strands that have been in the, um, that we've heard about in the news? Uh, do you anything you wanna say about that? Okay, so, sorry. Um, so it's a great question. Um, the, as of now, um, the strains we know, I haven't heard or read anything that this vaccine uh, is not protective against. Um, but of course, with every new thing to tell like this is doing, uh, this is protecting against this particular strain 100% times, um, you need to do more studies. Um, may there be new strains that may, um, that may not be affected by the vaccine, there may, as flu changes every year, um, this this virus might be changing its uh, its proteins a um, little bit every year, and then we may need to come up with new vaccines. Um, but I'm I'm pretty confident saying that um, the current vaccine uh, seems to be working pretty well. And we already have started seeing the positive effects of this vaccine um, by looking at the uh, numbers, um, the, the numbers of people who are getting sick or who are dying from uh, COVID uh, has already started decreasing. Uh, again, I'm not saying this um, to uh, put the put our guards down, uh, but I'm saying this um, as a 
um, as a sign that the vaccine is uh, likely working pretty well. Um, and again, we don't, not every pa single patient is, are being checked about, about what particular strain they were sick with. Um, so it might already be here. We, we don't necessarily know that, um, but it seems to be working. So the vaccine seems to be working so far for uh, all these uh, different strains that we know of. Thank you. Um, and just two more questions that we have. Um, there's a lot of talk about herd immunity and what that means. Um, is it um, one of the myths that kind of came up was there's no difference between the vaccine or herd immunity through people just getting COVID. And I'm wondering if what thoughts you have on, on that particular myth. So um, I haven't really heard many people uh, dying from the vaccine itself, uh, but by getting sick, we know millions of uh, people have died so far. So I think that that gives an idea um, for the difference between the herd immunity and the vaccination. Um, yes, herd immunity is a thing because if you get sick with that, you will have some immunity towards the towards the uh, disease. Uh, but you also uh, have the risk of being sick with the disease itself, significantly sick and um, at a level that uh, that may um, threaten your life or having those long term side effects from the disease itself as well. So. Yes, there is a there is a reality uh, such as herd immunity. If everybody gets the uh, gets the disease, um, then um, everybody will be will have some immunity towards it. Uh, but in that in that process, many people's uh, lives will be at risk. And just to add to that, the CDC does recommend receiving the vaccine when you're eligible. That's the best way to prevent yourself from coming sick. And there is something to say about that, you know, herd immunity. Um, but like Musafa said, you know, if you get sick with COVID, you, you could die and there's very low risk of, of getting, of dying from receiving the vaccine. Exactly what I was gonna say. And lastly, um, we know that uh, the vaccine is available for adults, but what about um, some of our maybe older adolescents or um, even younger kids? If our parents um, are curious if they can consent for their child to receive the vaccine. I'll go ahead, Mustafa. Um, so I was just gonna say that um, the vaccine is not available for children yet. Um, we do have parents asking, unfortunately it's not safe, it's not proven to be safe yet for children. Um, there, the uh, Pfizer vaccine is, uh, I believe is 16 and older and the Moderna is 18 and older. So um, with parent consent for a 16 year old, they can receive the Pfizer vaccine. If, if it's a PD pal patient though, I would say refer to your physician first as there's underlying medical conditions. There are studies currently uh, going on for children um, older than 12 years old. So um, probably after these are completed and that, that population is vaccinated, they will probably move it down to the younger, um, younger uh, age groups as well. Uh, which is very reassuring uh, for the immunity of the um, entire population. Um, but it's it's a really good idea to speak with your uh, physicians and um, because anyone who is older than 16 and living with medical complex conditions are eligible for this vaccine. And um, CDC and all the big children's hospitals 
um, to support these children being vaccinated. So definitely go ahead and speak with your physician. And uh, if they think it's okay for your child to be vaccinated, um, I would definitely recommend you to either schedule it or uh, get in contact with uh, one of the team members from pediatric palliative care team uh, to help you scheduling the uh, for a vaccination appointment and get them vaccinated, get yourself vaccinated so you can uh, create as much as protection as possible, both for your child and uh, for yourselves. Well, I want to thank you, Margie and Mustafa, for being our uh, our COVID panel to us experts uh, today and answering um, all of our questions. There's a good chance that there are many different questions or myths or whatever that we did not get to um, during this talk. So if you have any follow-up, um, like, hey, I was, I was thinking of this, or I'm curious about that, um, feel free to reach out to our team um, and we can try to get the information for you or point you in the right direction. Your primary care, your um, children's doctors are, of course, great resources to try to navigate um, this whole new vaccine world that we're living in. Um, but please do not hesitate to follow up if you have any questions. Um, so thanks so much. And I really appreciate everyone's participation. <laughs>